the theme for Architecture Fringe 2021 uh, is unlearning. Um, and as we're all uh, abundantly aware at the moment, um, things that once seemed solid are changing and fluid. And in order to make that change positive and transformative, we need to engage in a process of unlearning and learning anew. So the theme for 2021 is unlearning. Um, and we invite you to sort of join with us in that theme through your own events that you maybe want to program for Architecture Fringe to kind of explore, interrogate and, and expand on that theme. So um, as I say, we've invited Finn Harper to uh, give a, a brief talk at the start tonight. We'll take questions in the chat function. So the chat function you can find at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions that crop up um, during Finn's talk, then please feel free to, to uh, post them there and we'll gather them up at the end. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Finn um, for talking tonight. Uh, it's very kind of him to give up uh, his Thursday evening uh, to speak to us. Um, and by way of a very, very brief introduction, Finn is a critic and curator exploring the intersection of architecture and politics. He's currently director of Open City, a charity that works with architecture and urban design to make our built environment more accessive, accessible and inclusive. Um, and that is also part of the Open House Global Network. Prior to this, Finn worked as a deputy director at the Architecture Foundation and was a co-curator with Maria Smith, Matthew Diel, and C Cecily Sachs Olson of the 2019 Oslo Architecture Triennale um, with a program that was titled Enough, the Architecture of Degrowth. So taking over the helm of Open City as we entered the global pandemic has no doubt been challenging on a number of fronts, um, but one of the brilliant projects to come out of that was a new Open City publication, an alternative guide to the London boroughs. This was convened by Finn and edited by Owen Hatherley. Um, the book feels like a real explanation, exploration in the best sense of the word, a wander through the less well-documented parts of the city in book form. Uh, it's testimony to how powerful architecture, place and space can be when evocatively and critically explored through language, good writing and great insights from the broad range of contributors the book contains. Uh, anyway, I would urge you all strongly to get a copy. Uh, I'm not on a retainer or anything yet. Uh, but uh, anyway, tonight uh, Finn is gonna talk to us uh, about maintenance, care and the desire to neglect um, and it would be sort of expanding on how this possibly intersects with the theme that we've been talking about for Architecture 2021. So as I say, it's a 15 minute talk with a chance for questions at the end. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to Finn. Thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna immediately share my screen because I guess we're slightly behind schedule. I'm gonna try and catch up. Um, can someone say something if they can see blue text on a right black background? Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, let's kick off then. Um, thanks for having me. Um, good theme. So rare to see an architecture festival with an actually good theme. Um, I think this is a, 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 a typical of the architecture fringe to like kind of cut to the heart of the matter. Um, I approve thoroughly. So um, my talk is called Uncareful uh, and it's about care and it's about neglect. Um, what do the communist revolutionary leader Mao Zedong, uh, the kind of explorer and possible lover of Queen Elizabeth I, Walter Raleigh, and the German lawyer from the 19th century, Wilhelm Wumpf, have in common? Any guesses? No? Well, okay, the answer is earth architecture. In December 1893, Mao was born in uh, an earth house that was built by his father the childhood home of Walter Raleigh, Ease Barton, made of cob, which is a mix of earth and straw. And in 1825, Wumpf, uh, who was a lawyer, um, ditched the legal profession and uh, built one of the tallest earth buildings in, in, in Europe, uh, where it still stands 200 years later in Freiburg. Um, and in fact, of all the UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the world, um, more than 160 of them were built either wholly or partially from Earth. So for 10,000 years, Earth has been one of the most widely used construction materials on the planet. Um, and there's you know, a couple of sort of very famous examples, Shibam in, in Yemen, a kind of ancient high-rise Earth city. Uh, of course, the Hakka, which are these vast earthen wood 
roundhouses in China. I'm sure you can think of, of many other kind of um, epic examples of earth architecture from the past. But what's weird is that despite its vanishingly small carbon footprint, earth is almost absent from contemporary architecture. Young architects today are rarely being tutored in how to design with adobe or cob or rammed earth. Indeed, they barely are even taught the terms. Instead, uh, we are generally trained to use a narrow catalogue of highly processed, high carbon materials that it's de cement, standalone, of course, accounting for about 7% of the global carbon dioxide emissions on its own. So to address climate, the, the climate emergency, few industries must transform as deeply and as fast as construction and architecture, and yet Earth one of the lowest impact materials on the market and our kind of key ally in this fight is barely used. Why? Well, a popular criticism of earth construction is that it requires um, regular maintenance, which is a feature widely considered a weakness in architecture. The materials that define our built landscape have often been used not for their ecological value at all, but simply to do one thing, to reduce the burden of periodic maintenance. Thatched roofs, oh no, thatched roofs for example have been uh, tiled over, green spaces get paved over, tarmac gets poured over cobbles such as this picture here. All of this trying to do the same thing which is to reduce the maintenance requirements of this physical fabric. In construction, there is just this giant consensus among developers, among local authorities, among architects, among the general public, that repairing things as little as possible is an important goal. In fact, there's a certain amount of moralizing that goes with this. When a material weathers badly, uh, we are very quick to chastise the architect for not having had the foresight to anticipate this deterioration and specify a more hard wearing material instead. And here, for example, is Peter Barber's Donnybrook Quarter in East London, which has been um, sometimes criticized as Pete, when he designed it, um, painted it all bright white, which, uh, you know, in a damp UK climate goes a bit moldy, as you can kind of see under the, the window there. Uh, and the paint has also kind of peeled off uh, the balcony. Um, so we claim that a careful architect is one who anticipates maintenance requirements designs in order to avoid them. But I think this is the exact opposite of careful. I think to be full of care should mean to be very willing to check in with whatever we are caring for and to demonstrate our care through many small acts of restoring and cultivation rather than seeking from the outset to reduce our caring obligations entirely. That's not careful at all. That is careless, that is uncare. And so I want to argue that it is um, this desire to not repair, to not maintain, and to not care for the fabric of buildings once they are built that is ecologically and socially toxic and is something we must unlearn. It is fundamentally at odds with our deepest human instincts. It's hard to think of many examples where this desire to demonstrate love not through showing acts of care is positive, but it's easy to think of the opposite. Think, for example, of a young parent continuously checking on their newborn child, alert to any deterioration of health, mood, or happiness, ready to step in with feeding or nappy changing or cuddles of other or other acts of care at a moment's notice. Think of love smitten teenagers who text and call each other hourly, sometimes more, constantly checking in, fueling the fire of their romance with small pings of affection and interest. Think of the pious disciple who prays frequently to their God, famously um, among Muslims five times a day, even in the middle of the night, constantly topping up a relationship with the divine. Think of the gardener who must periodically and patiently prune, pick, water and weed their flower beds, slowly cultivating. A garden cannot be rushed, nor can it be left unattended for very long. A nutritionist who knows that a balanced diet of regular meals is far healthier than occasional gluttonous binge eating, or a personal trainer who recommends daily exercise of 20 minutes rather than an annual marathon followed by 12 months on the sofa. I could go on. But metaphors aside, there's a pretty strong ecological case uh, to turn our backs on hard-wearing materials and instead embrace an architecture of care and maintenance. I'm going to just quickly talk through that ecological argument. So this is the Darwin Center. It's in the Natural History Museum. It was designed by C.F. Muller, who are uh, Danish architects. And I saw them present it when I was a student. 
um, and they, they made a big show about telling me that this giant concrete egg, um, 60 meters long, 300 millimeter thick concrete um, uh, sort of laboratories and exhibition spaces was a very sustainable building. And I asked, you know, you know, what makes you think this is a sustainable building? It doesn't seem very sustainable. Um, and the, the, the architect from CF Muller who was presenting it said, well, you know, the thing is, um, it's sustainable because it will last for a long time, last for 200 years, he said. And so even though it emits a lot of carbon in day one, that's fine because, you know, over 200 years, that's actually quite a low amount of carbon. It seems sort of sensible, but actually it isn't. We know now that he was dead wrong because we don't have 200 years. This is the whole point of these tipping points that uh, were kind of in the news recently about um, how fast the, uh, the problem of climate change accelerates if we don't do something about it quickly. Um, we don't have 200 years to kind of parcel out the carbon impact of a 200 year building. We have to reduce carbon emissions now full stop. And the implications um, of this for architecture are totally profound because it means that um, it is no good making tough buildings that will last a long time at the expense of emitting a lot of carbon in their construction. That's no longer a viable model. So longevity, hard wearingness, solidity, the very seductive values that we've invoked with material strategies over the years might have to be rethought or abandoned entirely. And maybe the architectural alternative to this is an architecture of care, an architecture which is not tough at all, that in fact requires constant maintenance as a design um, feature, but that doesn't come with that front-loaded blast of a high carbon emissions in construction. So what would that kind of architecture be like? What would an architecture of maintenance be like? Um, I think thatch is a very interesting kind of, again, historic example. Thatch comes in all shapes and sizes. It's pretty much as global as people and plants are. Um, the reason we don't build with thatch is because it requires maintenance. A roof like this would need to be replaced every sort of 10 to 15 years. But ecologically, it's better to replace this roof every decade than to build it once out of concrete. So what could a architecture that actually embraces care be like? Well, I think there's an interesting example from uh, Mali. This is the Great Mosque in Jenne. It's um, covered with these protruding bundles of rods. They're called torren. Um, and they're kind of decorative, right? They make the sort of facade have, have a bit of animation, looks a bit more fortified than it would do otherwise. But they serve another purpose because they are in fact permanent scaffolding that enables the mud facade of this earth brick building to be repaired every year after heavy rains damage it. Another example from Cameroon uh, is these um, Tollock houses, Muslim Tollock houses. So they have this incredibly beautiful geometric patterning on the surface. It's a, it's a cantinery dome in form. They're, 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 they, they taper from, um, I think, uh, that's about 30 centimeters to just um, five centimeters in, in thickness. Um, they're a remarkable feat of engineering, um, but this pattern on the outside is not just decorative, it is also uh, um, a kind of three-dimensional ladder that allows um, the, the residents of, of the houses to clamber over the building and repair the, the mud facade when it needs maintenance. And I think this, this, the, both the Torren and the Tollock houses um, are doing something very interesting because they're invoking a duality, an architectural expression that is both decorative and functional, right? And if you think of Louis Sullivan's, Sullivan's famous phrase that form should follow function to express his proto-modernist philosophy that the aesthetic qualities of buildings should derive from meeting pragmatic challenges. It's interesting that this has been alive and well in Cameroon for centuries before Sullivan. And this duality is a theme we can find elsewhere in design history. In Japan, for example, the borrow technique is a way of mending garments again and again, handed down through generations um, until they develop a kind of patchwork quality and it's hard to tell where the original garment ever was. Or kintsugi, the art of expressing the repair of a, a broken ceramic by dusting it with precious metals, dusting the repair with precious metals. 
And it's not so hard, you know, th these are all kind of very traditional, almost folk examples. But I think there's something similar going on in uh, the high-tech masters. Um, this is Norman Foster's uh, HSBC building in, in Hong Kong. And this is a cleaning crane. On the roof of it. So this is a piece of infrastructure to enable these large windows to be washed every now and then. But it's also architectural form. It's also saying something about the thrust of Foster's high tech, um, that it should be machine-like and militaristic. And um, there's something similar happening on the Lloyds building. Richard Rogers picks out this sort of electric blue for the cleaning infrastructure. So if cleaning can be a source of architectural expression, why can't maintenance as well? going to flip through a couple. Um, and I think there's something that we could even learn here from uh, heavy metal, right? This is a, uh, as those of you who are fans of heavy metal know, this is a, a battle jacket. So that sort of denim waistcoat that you, um, uh, you patch all of the patches of the bands you like and the gigs you've gone to the festival you've been to onto this waistcoat. And over time, it starts to tell a very rich story about its wearer's travels and tastes. And you really care for this thing, right? You constantly, um, it gets a lot of wear, <laughs> gets a lot beaten up in mosh pits and so on. And so you constantly care for it. You, you mend it and you repair it. And that's partly why patches have become a feature of the kind of heavy metal aesthetic. But importantly, um, it's not pristine. Like the very kind of aesthetic culture of heavy metal allows a little bit of shabbiness to be permissive. We're not talking about Peter Barber's uh, pristine white walls in Donnybrook Quarter anymore, where even a, a bit of chip paint is seen as a failure. In fact, in the, with the battle, back, back at, battle jacket tradition, the opposite is true, that wear and tear is sort of part of the fun of the thing. And it would be a bit weird if this was brand new or hadn't gone through the wards. I think Hunterwasser was on something similar. This is Hunterwasser House in Vienna. Um, a housing scheme refurbishing an older building. And um, Hunterwasser had this idea that residents should be able to repair their own facades, even if they lived in a block of flats. And I think what he's doing here with the paint scheme is sort of suggesting that if a resident were to make a repair, even a very slightly botched and obvious repair, it would still feel comfortable and at home in a cohesive whole. So giving aesthetic permission for repairs to take place. And so, so finally, to finish, um, I kind of wonder if all of this wraps up to question the role of the architect. Perhaps the architect of the future is less of a visionary sculpting form from pure imagination that will be fixed in space forever, and more maybe of a spatial therapist, someone who constantly reconfigures elements and matter to improve the lives and conditions of their clients. I think it's recognized that our, addi our addiction to minimizing maintenance is really a toxic desire to not care. So if we're going to unlearn things, let's unlearn that desire and instead embrace slow, steady, incremental, constant acts of care, soft, low carbon materials regularly maintained. And that is why for me, the new role model for architecture is not Howard Rourke, but is in fact groundskeeper Willie. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, thank you, Finn. That's an absolute killer final slide. So yeah, that was uh, that was a great talk. Thank you for thank you very much. Um, we've got a, got some questions in, so I'm going to rather than taking the chair's prerogative and asking a question, I'm going to just going to invite um, the people who have uh, have asked uh, to do that. So we have one from Dave Loder. Dave, do you want to just unmute and uh, sure. ask? Sure. There. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that 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 great talk, Finn. It was very uh, pro pro provocative and a very timely and uh, 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 active active res response to the the uh, theme of of uh, arc 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 fringe. Um, my my um, question relates to um, who who it is might actually be doing this this care and this uh, main, main, maintenance. Um, suppose if 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 we think about, um, say, civ civic infra infrastructure and um, who might maintain that, and when it's maintained by 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 the um, state or or uh, other forms of inst inst institution, um, those who maintain it are those who actually codify it, and in some ways um, can 
conceal that that infrastructure from the uh, public. Whereas um, I was I was but, but because I was quite struck by those those uh, modern earth buildings that you were showing there, where it seems to be it's the uh, public who is who is doing the the um, care and uh, maintenance. So there's there's a there's maybe a, a question there about who 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 should be doing that maintenance and and um what what the uh, rule for 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 a different different types of a public or a different types of com, com, community might there be thanks dave um yeah great question i mean this is uh obviously it's very efficient if you're if you have a nation state to employ caretakers park keepers street sweepers maintenance people who go around tinkering and fixing things that would be a very efficient way to do it but actually as you know as as you know we've seen a kind of total hollowing out of public sector investment in care and it's much easier for local authorities to get capital investment to build new stuff than it is to get ongoing investment to care for existing stuff and this i think means that over time you just have the kind of kind of gradual abandonment of facilities and the gradual decline of um uh buildings and, and public spaces um and then eventually someone comes along and says oh this is beyond repair we need to knock it down and start again but you know that 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 could have been avoided if only someone had had the um foresight to and and the responsibility and act on the responsibility to care for the for, for the stuff in the first place. But I do think there's, there's a, a slide that I skipped over um, that I'm gonna come back to. Um, the, these are uh, these, there's a series of um, transparent tools that were designed by a product designer. Sorry, I'll make that full screen. And the idea here was that, um, as you, 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 know, you mentioned concealed infrastructure, um, that's sort of true of product design as well. A lot of product des products are designed to be hard to repair or even impossible to repair sometimes. And it's sort of confusing and they're in like vacuum formed plastic cases and so on. So the, the, the transparent tools series was an attempt to make household objects like um, a toaster or a kettle or a vacuum cleaner look and feel easy to repair. And the thought there was that if, you, um, if, if, you, if your household objects seemed a little more straightforward to repair, maybe people would be more likely to have a go at repairing them rather than throwing them away and buying one from scratch. Um, and I think there's a, maybe a kind of architectural implication for this, which is like, don't conceal the infrastructure, make it a bit more visible, make it a bit more um, obvious so that then if something goes wrong, maybe you, you even as a, a sort of a citizen could have a go at repairing it without needing, you know, permission from your landlord or permission from your leaseholder or whatever um, to have a go at, at, at sorting this out yourself. So I'm, I, I do believe that there's a, a, a really important role for the public sector to kind of reclaim its role as the steward of the land and to, to care for things better. But I also think there's sort of things that we could do as citizens to make repair um, more intuitive and more permi permitted. Thanks, Finn. Um, there's been a couple of other questions in. I'm aware that we're kind of running on for time. So what I'm going to do is, is try and um, roll them into one question um, with us in advance, seeking apologies from the askers in case I mangle anything in the process. But um, there's, they're, they're both, I guess, um, connect to the economics of this. So, so uh, they're questions about how do we make the economic case for, um, for care and maintenance um, say with, for example, developers or clients who are obsessed with uh, like maximizing profit and quick, uh, you know, and, and doing, doing so quickly. And, uh, you know, the ideas of VAT on repair, zero on new build, all of these kind of cultural um, artifacts that we're kind of living with, um, cultural sort of, sort of uh, economic processes that we're living with and have become very normalized. How do we break through that to kind of um, show other ways uh, that, we can, that we could kind of do these things? So it's the, uh, the sort of the real politic or the real economic situation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I understand. Well, um, I mean, yeah, VAT on refurbishing buildings is insane. We just need to campaign to get that abolished. Like it's people have been saying this for decades. Um, it's a, a, a weird loophole 
that someone just needs to close because it's it's such a sort of silly incentive to 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 pollute essentially so it's a 20 percent cheaper to not recycle than to recycle um so there are now campaigns it's you know people are calling upon the government to um scrap that 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 vat giveaway on on refurbishment or on new build um uh on the on the sort of the wider question of um how do you pay for repair a lot of the time it's it's um it's really good value for money to to repair thing get care for things properly as long as you have a, a big enough time window to model it so um maybe the model of um making your return in 20 years doesn't doesn't work so well but over 200 years it works really well so I think that's a kind of question for how we finance construction and the built environment. Um, and we are actually starting to see this a little bit. There are kind of pension funds who are still a bit um, scarred from 2008 and aren't looking for 20 year investments. They're looking for super stable 200 year investments. Um, this is partly because economic growth is so low in developed economies that um, buying government bonds is no longer a good thing to do if you're a pension fund. And so instead pension funds are, are thinking, okay, well, what if we like built a housing estate and we just took a sort of two or 3% return for 400 years from that housing estate, would that be a good investment? And um, uh, I think it would, but uh, so that, yeah, that's about how we fight that is sort of about monetary policy and it's about how we finance the, um, the construction industry. Um, but the, the, the sort of the, the, the biggest point on economics really is, is that like ec the more economic activity you have, the worse it is for the climate. Uh, and this whole idea that you can have a growing economy but shrinking carbon emissions is a myth. And at some point, um, either because we will be forced to or because we design a way to, we will have to figure out a way to create a stable state economy that is not growing um, in, in GDP year on year. Uh, and that is, I think, quite exciting, but it's only exciting if you uh, approach it as a designer rather than as a kind of catastrophist where you, you just realize that GDP is going to stop growing at some point. Um, so we need to kind of see that change coming and, and come up with a, a plan for it. And that's really what degrowth is about. And that's what the Oslo Triennale, the Oslo Architecture Triennale was about, was, was saying, okay, what would a good economy look like that's not trying to grow GDP year on year? Um, and once you start thinking about that, then you stop um, prioritizing um, productivity in the same way that uh, kind of classical economists do and suddenly spending a lot of human energy on repairing buildings becomes a really really sound ecological thing to do it's a bit like um uh you know aoc's green new deal thing that, that there'll be a kind of retooling and a lot of um industrial workers will be kind of redeployed as stewards of uh the biosphere and I think there's a sort of parallel narrative to that, which is that a lot of workers will be redeployed as stewards of the urban realm um, through mass repair schemes. Great, thanks, Finn. And um, I think, yeah, I probably would urge people to maybe check out the the um, the work from that the Oslo Triennale as well, um, which I think there's there's stuff online publication as well so if anyone's interested in finding out more about about that um, there's stuff online but I just want to say um, a big thank you Finn for for that talk it was a really like interesting set of provocations and um, some beautiful imagery as well in uh, to, to illustrate it as well so thanks so much for doing that um, for us um, and uh, yeah um, yeah big thank you from architecture friend <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.